Well, welcome uh, once again uh, to our Bible study here at Good Shepherd Lutheran Church in Appleton, Wisconsin. I hope you're having a wonderful warm day, uh, even for this uh, time of February, in which most of our attentions do turn to uh, warmer weather that we, that we all want uh, sooner than later. However, we know, at least around here, uh, March Madness, if you're familiar with the basketball tournaments, uh, typically we get a snow, a heavy snow, around that time. So, uh, although it's pretty nice today and it's, it's been nice recently, we can, uh, you know, still, still, uh, you know, uh, be careful uh, that the snow may still be, be with us. But as we think about the snow, we think about Lent upcoming, really, as we conclude Epiphany, uh, God gives us great instruction today, Jesus, on loving your enemies, love your enemies. And so our prayer as we get started, uh, Martin Luther, Doctor and Confessor, February the 18th, uh, God of grace and mercy, you love the world so much that you sent your servant Martin to help turn our hearts to you. As we celebrate Martin's feast, may we give thanks for his counsel and listen to his wisdom. Martin's heart and mind were always fixed on your son, burning to follow him. May we, with your help, also follow Jesus with a single-hearted focus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So really appropriate, uh, loving your neighbors, Martin Luther, and knowing the love of Jesus, and uh, also then uh, wanting to uh, love as he has first been loved. And that's what we uh, need to focus on when we talk about enemies and, and neighbors, is we love others because, of course, God first loved us. So Jesus says, but I say to you who hear, uh, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. If you want who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Uh, for me, when I think about uh, this text, uh, is the fact that we have to even talk about enemies. I don't like to talk about that fact. I don't like to think about the fact that we have enemies uh, in our lives. It's not God's intention at all. Uh, Satan became an enemy because he rebelled against God and became jealous of God. Enemies are not uh, the way God wants us to live with him and with others. So it's hard to even think about or talk about enemies, but it, but it is our reality. So as in all things, what God's word helps us to do, what God guides us to do is to understand our living conditions and still live in him and for him. So to live godly and Christian lives. So this is, this is part of it. Um, how can we possibly keep on loving our enemies? All right, how can we do this? Well, simply put, is that we are Christians, and that means to follow Jesus, and Jesus says so. So we are, because Jesus commands it, and when he gives the command, he doesn't do so without the possibility of it being carried out. So Jesus commands, and the Holy Spirit guides. So the Holy Spirit is equipping us, strengthening us, helping us to uh, not only have this relationship with God, but carry it out uh, in our lives. So we can't do it on our own, but we are to do it because Jesus commands the Holy Spirit guides us. Um, and it becomes the right thing to do. It's, it's right to, to do so. Does Jesus offer the other cheek also suggests that you must stay in and just endure an abusive situation? Now, this is where, you know, our misguided logic and, and trying, I think, to find ways in which we can uh, wiggle out of God's commands. Uh, we just talked about uh, divorce and uh, the union between man and a woman, and, you know, they would question Jesus' teaching on that. 
well, does this mean that, well, this, this possibility, this possibility exists, and therefore, you know, we can't get divorced anyhow. Again, the fact we have to talk about this means that there is corruption in our world, that things aren't the way uh, that they, they need to be. And the same is true uh, when it comes to abusive situations, pe uh, when people want to do us physical harm. Uh, is this uh, a good relationship that God says, well, of course you have to stay in it. Uh, because, well, you're in this relationship and this means loving your neighbor. No, God also gives us wisdom. He gives us the understanding uh, to not uh, put ourselves in those situations and remain in those. These situations that occur, we're not necessarily putting ourselves in these situations. I mean, they are just a part of what it is to be a Christian in our world. You know, we're going to suffer hate. We're going to be cursed. We're going to be abused, okay? This is what takes place just as the fact of being a Christian. So this has nothing to do then with being in an abusive situation. It's just part of our lifestyle. So the answer, of course, is no. You don't have to stay in it uh, because it is something that doesn't affect your role as a Christian. And, and to, to use the godly wisdom that God has given you and to make good decisions uh, in your life um, is important to do. We also can maybe reference, if you want, uh, appropriately, uh, the fourth commandment. Um, is there a time when we do not obey those who have an authority over us? And God's word gives us a counsel. We don't obey those who have authority over us when they abuse God's word, when they tell us to do something contrary to God's word. Um, so that's what we want to think about here. But for the most part, we accept this as our Christian life within a sinful world. This part is not being a Christian in a sinful world. This is in a relationship that is toxic, and, and you need to, to use your wisdom and the support around you uh, to be in safe situations. Um, if you are in this situation right now, please let me know so that somebody know uh, this should not be tolerated, um, and the person should who is abusing uh, should be held accountable for that. Uh, that breaks the fifth commandment, right? Not harming your neighbor in his body. So there is repercussions for that as well. But again, when we talk about our life as Christians, we can expect these things. This would be is really telling us and how to live with these expectations. Like take up your cross daily and follow me. That's what this. Uh, corresponds to. This is what we can expect uh, what it is to take up our cross and follow Jesus. Uh, so then it continues. Uh, Give to everyone who begs from you and from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. We know this is the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. We're going to take a look at this again here. Uh, for a Christian disciple, what is most uh, what is more important than hanging on to, on to or getting back what belongs to you? You know, our attention has to be on our brother who is, you know, is committing committing sin, and 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 being a Christian example in all circumstances. Now, we oftentimes just throw out what would Jesus do, and we talk about what Jesus do when it's convenient for us. This is, these are the times when what would Jesus do isn't convenient for us. I mean, Jesus submitted himself to those who hated him, and when they beat him, when they mocked him, when they ridiculed him, he did not uh, defend himself as he could have, and maybe as he should have. But if he would have, it wouldn't have been, it wouldn't have completed our salvation. Um, so we want to serve as a Christian example. Uh, we want to detour you know, those who take our stuff, steal, that's a breaking uh, the command. But ultimately, as you hear so often, um, if somebody is committing a crime with you, call the proper authorities. You know, let them handle it. It's going to cause more problems uh, than good. And also tells us there are people who are greedy and, and, and just, again, miserable sinners in our world. So how do you reconcile making the spiritual values of God's kingdom your primary concern uh, with a citizen's responsibility uh, to be concerned about and 
to work at stopping crime and apprehending punishing criminals, uh, they go hand in hand. You know, we, we live in the kingdom of, of the left and the kingdom of the right. We live in the kingdom of, of God and, and the kingdom of man. Uh, there are rules that govern our lives that God has established through our leaders. So as we think about punishing and apprehending and stopping crime, we should all be concerned about that because crime against others is crime against God's word, and that is a part of, of the values that we also carry uh, with us in God's kingdom. The difference happens for the Christian is loving your enemies still. Ours is to forgive those who ask for forgiveness. The world will tell us, as Jesus just said, the world says, um, you know, that we should hate our enemies and, and, you know, seek revenge and all these other things. Jesus, the spiritual values that we incorporate into our law of keeping is one in which we want to maintain the law, keep the law that God has given to us. We don't get to break it as Christians. Um, and then to practice forgiveness, which is uh, our responsibility. As Jesus forgave those on the cross. You know, Father, forgive them. They do not what they do. Jesus, as you wish that others would uh, do to you, do so to them, uh, says. Uh, it's the golden rule. It's not uniquely Christian. Again, this is the extension of our lives here and our spiritual lives, our Christian lives. It appears in one form or another in many of the world's religious and eth ethical systems. What does the golden rule say t uh, to you for your personal life? I mean, it's just simple. We love ourselves. So we love me, and so I want what is best for me, so best for me. And therefore, I want what is best for my neighbor <laughs> because it's best for me. Best for my neighbor is best for me, too. Indeed, it's selfish, but it actually works when it comes to keeping God's commandments. You don't want to be stolen from, don't steal from others. You don't want to be uh, killed, don't kill others. You don't want to have a commit adultery, don't commit adultery, you know, against you. So, um, yeah, it's self-serving, you know, what's best for me um, is also best for my neighbor. So we keep this, this wonderful uh, balance and understanding of uh, loving God, loving our neighbor, uh, adhering to God's command is what we should always want to do. Um, and that is do unto others as you would have them do unto you. If you're okay with, you know, someone committing adultery and killing and stealing, you go do the same, but then you're not being a Christian either uh, in pursuing that and carrying it out. There are those who say, I try to live by the golden rule and are serious about it. They work hard at it and may be quite successful at putting it into practice. What is missing in a golden rule approach to life, even when seriously pursued, that keeps it from fully encouraging and implementing the principles of Christian discipleship. And this is the, the, pro, this is the uh, Good Samaritan here. The problem is that we're still sinners. Sinners still. And as much as we want to keep and adhere to the golden rule, we still fall short of the glory of God. It's a wonderful way to demonstrate our life with the with Christ, but uh, from fully implementing it and fully doing it, uh, just like any perfect law keeping, we can't do it. I mean, this all makes perfect sense, right? No one's going to disagree uh, with this thought. No one. But like so many things in our lives, sin gets in the way and corrupts what what can be. Um, but but this is the Garden of Eden. And we don't live in that anymore. Um, we can pray for world peace and love for our neighbor. It's never going to be fully realized here. doesn't mean we don't pursue it, but, but it just won't. And so that's why, you know, we, by the Holy Spirit, remember earlier, 
um, guiding us in God's word to, to, to keep you know, this balance in our lives and live for Christ in the midst of the strain and stressors uh, that we all face. And, the, and, and basically living with others each and every day. And, and wanting our light to shine before others. So if you love those who love you, what, be, uh, what benefit is that for you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? Even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those who, whom you re, uh, expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. And the, the concluding of this uh, text goes, Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, uh, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use it, it will be measured back to you. And we talk about uh, also the fourth commandment here, um, that it will go well with you when you honor those in authority. You'll live long on the earth. You know, less, less strain, less stress, less tension. Uh, so what motivates Christian disciples to go beyond the natural love of family and friends to pursue the ideals of the kingdom? Loving even those who abuse them and practicing a detachment regarding material things. What is the motivation? that it is God's love to us. That's, that's what our motivation is. This perfect, complete love in Jesus who died and rose for us, that heaven is our home, uh, the world is not, but we can make uh, the world, a, a while we're living here, a place that closer resembles God's word by living according to it. So how can we live in the fact that, try as we may, we can continue to fall short of these ideals? Um, it's a fruit of the Spirit, right? The response to God's love is good works, and it's loving others. So God's love, if you know this, you still are to love one another and, and to effort for that. I mean, people talk about making the world a better place all the time. And, and we should strive for that. Um, but if you're not going to love your neighbor, then you're not accomplishing that. And Christ is really not in you. How do you reconcile Jesus' judge not and condemn not with the Bible directives to rebuke, admonish, and discipline? You know, this is this overreach we have today in which uh, people will use this, these, these words to say that it excuses their behavior. So, right, if, if, if you remove the law, which is judgment, then everything goes. So is there any accountability today? We know who the judge is. So Jesus is the judge. This is the judge, the ultimate judge. He gives us his word as a guide for our lives. As Christians, we know to break the word. So if we break the word, that is sin, and sin leads to death, and Jesus will judge us to death. So we can throw our hands up in the air and say, well, it's not my responsibility. I'm not going to judge anybody. You know, begin with the understanding that to commit sin, you're a slave to sin, you're dead to sin, and you're going to die forever. If you don't act, if you don't speak, uh, you're not doing God's work. But when you speak, speak the truth in love. Recognize you also are a sinner and that you appreciated when someone rebuked, admonished, and disciplined you. Otherwise, what, would you even be alive today? What kind of person would you be? So uh, don't use this as a cop-out to, to ignore sin. Use it to understanding that you are concerned about the soul and that's why you... Uh, share. Jesus will judge them if they remain in sin. They're going to say, well, wait a second. No one told me that this was wrong. And that's when we are accountable, too. 
So give and it will be given to you. Encourages generosity and helping the needy. Uh, what attitude do we need toward our money if we are going to work at applying this kingdom directed to our lives? Attitude toward money um, is, is simply that God, God provides. Um, you who are active tithers out there or maybe experiencing it for the first time, I can understand that um, God, God blesses us and we don't deserve it, but uh, we understand that God is working in all of our means that we have to be a blessing toward others. So um, it's not as if we're giving money so as to have more. Uh, we give because God has blessed us with this. But God will also, you know, help us in our time uh, of need, and he blesses us with our abundance to be a blessing to others. So uh, when you recognize it, uh, then you want to serve the Lord, and financial gifts are one way to do so. Uh, in a world in which a number of needy people is overwhelming, what practical steps may we take to implement this ideal in the kingdom? Um, well, first of all, you know, in our communities, you got to assess, assess the problem. Uh, then you got to, you know, you got to create a plan to handle it, and then you got to act on it. Uh, again, thankfully, in, in the Fox Cities, we have places like Levin, um, St. Joe's Food Pantry, and the like, who are very good at doing this. Um, so. Assess the, assess the situation. What, what's the main problem? How can the church be involved? You know, don't be ignorant to the problem. And then, and then work in, in ways that you can actually make a difference. Not everybody's going to have a food pantry at their church because you simply don't have the space or the time uh, to do it or the people power. But there's other ways that you can uh, be a blessing to others. Um, so think about that. Um, even when it comes to giving money to, to again, organizations. It can be time, your talents, and your treasures all used as a blessing. Have you experienced the truth of Jesus' promises in your own life? Um, I would say that when we can say that I am content and that I am worry-free, you know, then we are at the right, the right, uh, the right response. So if you can say, I'm content, I'm worry-free, God is good. What, is there more that I would like to have, whether I need or want? Yeah, possibly. But when I think about my life, you know, I am blessed. Food, clothing, shelter, daily work, family, friends, for these uh, first article gifts. You know, God is, God is really good to us. Um, so as we consider loving our enemies today, it is about um, understanding the Christian life, the Christian vocation, to model our lives after Jesus, even when it's the most difficult to do. And, and in so doing, God's love lives in us so that we can love our neighbor, uh, even, even the ones that are hard to love. And the golden rule is good. Um, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. How do I want to be treated? The way I want to be treated is the way I treat others. So keep this in mind, uh, light of the world that we are in Epiphany, Jesus the light that lives in us. Truly, loving our neighbor is doing that. And living according to God's word. And, um, and being faithful uh, to, to God's commands. And, and helping others to recognize the importance of being godly people and being uh, those who are willing and ready to follow God's word as well. Well, thanks for joining me today. I uh, hope you're having a, a good one once again, a warm day. Um, nonetheless, though, uh, we are in the season of Epiphany. God says to love our neighbors. May you be doing so today and every day.